A very warm welcome to all of you, friends, colleagues, distinguished guests to this very special event that we are hosting today. Um, and we are delighted and very honoured to welcome Ambassador Platt <coughs> to give a talk here today at the Confucius Institute for Scotland in the University of Edinburgh. And um, as you know, Confucius Institutes are platforms to promote understanding of China today and promote Chinese language learning. And the whole initiative has meanwhile grown into a network of more than 350 institutes worldwide within a very short period of several years. <clears throat> and Ambassador Platt has seen many changes in China over the past decades. Um, and certainly nobody has expected this sort of presence of China in the world as it happens today, and playing a, a global role not only as an economic or political power, but also a cultural player. Um, so I'm sure there will be much to be discussed today about changes in China, but more importantly, we will hear about <clears throat> a period 40 years ago when actually China's opening policy started, um, um, and when Ambassador Platt was um, one of the State Department's officials to accompany Nixon's visit to China in 1972. So we're very much looking forward to hear about these events and other experiences, which are also wonderfully described <coughs> in this fascinating and very readable book by Ambassador Platt, um, China Boys, How U.S. Relations with the PRC Began and Grew, and which is also on sale outside in front of the door. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, I would like to finish uh, with extending greetings from Lord Wilson of Tilliorn, who was very sad he could not attend this event, which, um, <clears throat> uh, and I quote him here, one of the State Department's foremost China specialists. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Platt tonight. <clears throat> Thank you, Natasha, for your warm welcome, and thank you all for coming. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I want you to know that the lady who is on the dedication page of this book, riding a motorcycle, is here today. Sheila Platt, my wife, <laughs> is dedicated to my marvelous adventurous wife who rode with me the whole way. And and when we get to questions and answers, if you have questions about the distaff side, about raising children, about families, that kind of thing, she is going to answer them. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, organize this session uh, in three parts. First of all, the overall arc is China then and now. And we start China then, showing some films that I took um, as an amateur filmmaker, um, which I did for my fam with my family and so forth over the years, and always had a camera in, of one sort or another in my in my bag. And of course, in those days, they were eight millimeter, and you they didn't have any sound, and they didn't have any high definition or anything like that. So these are quite antique. I put them together in 1975 in Tokyo. After having, um, after having left China and gone to Tokyo, and the people there were extremely interested in what had happened and what we were, um, what life in China was like. So I put together a little bit less than a half an hour of pictures, not only of the Nixon trip but also of. Uh, life in, in uh, China in 1973 when we first opened up our diplomatic offices, these sort of diplomatic halfway houses that both sides called liaison offices. Um, <clears throat> so what I will do then is to show this film and then I'll read you a little bit from the book. The book is a transitional document which gets you from those days on to the future and what the, what the relationship, how it grew and how it developed. And then finally, we'll throw the 
session open to you. Find out what your questions are. Talk about China now. Um, I myself keep returning and, and uh, go back at least twice a year. Uh, so I've tried to keep au courant with this extraordinary dynamic country. So the scene is set here. This is the this, the first scene is at the Beijing airport in February of 1972. President Nixon is about to arrive. You can see lined up all of the, the honor guard. Uh, it's a cold February day. And people are wondering, you know, what's going to happen when Nixon and Joe meet? Uh, will they shake hands? Will they shake hands for a long time, for a short time? Uh, the Chinese never forgot that John Foster Dulles, our Secretary of State years before, had failed to, had, had refused to shake Joe Lai's hand at an international conference. So here's what's going to happen, and we'll take a look. Of course, my position was a lowly one. I was Secretary of State William Rogers, most uh, his private secretary, and I was there to keep the records of his meetings. Um, which enabled me as a note taker to keep a good record for posterity. Anyway, let's start rolling this and see what happens. Now you can, you can, uh, the, the, you can see for the first time American flag is flying over Beijing airport. Here comes Air Force One and my lowly position enabled me to take pictures from behind the engines you can see. Uh, but it's a, it's a worm's eye view for sure. And here's Nixon, and there's Joe shaking hands, and shaking hands some more, and shaking hands <laughs> more after that. This is a picture that just proves I was there. And so, then you have, we went to the Great Wall on a beautiful uh, frozen day when the trees were filled with ice. Here's the newspaper men who thronged the wall. Uh, the most important thing that happened, in addition to Nixon being there, was that there was this huge, huge truck, uh, communications truck, which um, connected this scene to the rest of the world. And it was symbolic of what had happened um, and what was happening, which was the communications between the Chinese and the American people starting off. We also went to the Ming tombs. Here's Mrs. Nixon in her famous red coat, um, looking a bit, a little bit fat, but it's it's because of the, it's because of the distortion of the the the, uh, uh, the video. Here's some pretty little girls who were trained to, to entertain us, and then we had we went into a Ming tomb and then we came right out again. <laughs> um, we weren't you couldn't take pictures inside. We also went to the forbidden city, snowy day, um, rare snow in Beijing at that time. You could barely see. Um, but it was a ra rather remarkable sight. Everybody was cleaning off the snow with old brooms. There are some of the magnificent buildings in the, in the, uh, in the Forbidden City, and here comes the president and his wife in their car. Now, can everybody hear me? because I want to make sure that you can. Um, these are really just scenes that show you the kind of uh, very visual events that occurred. It was all done very, very um, uh, purposefully to get the most photogenic scenes on in the morning and the evening at prime time for TV in the United States. And um, the purport of that uh, was to show what China was like. Here's, here's what the motorcade looked like. And it's a fairly big, and here was the Chinese reaction to us, deep interest. Here are some of the big players in, in, in Hangzhou uh, feeding the fish, Nixon himself, um, Joan Lai, um, Henry Kissinger, and so forth. Well, they laid the groundwork. Of course, Nixon didn't know he was, um, he'd had a big success till he got home. There was a tumultuous welcome at Andrews Air Force Base, not planned. 
Um, crowds came, the roads were jammed, and he knew that somehow he had made an impression. Sheila was less impressed, and uh, she was uh, here giving me the, uh, what are you doing here and where have you been look. Um, but I was very glad to see her, and I brought her a small token of my appreciation. Now, uh, 14 months later, we're crossing the bridge at Luo Wu uh, into Shenzhen. Um, this is a much, low, much lower level delegation. My, my secretary, uh, some security guards, all headed to start, start up the U.S. liaison office in Beijing. And our first location for offices was in the Beijing Hotel, which looked like that in 1973. We were in the Russian wing, which looked right out over the uh, golden roofs of the Forbidden City. More importantly for me, it looked into a courtyard uh, where our family was living. And we got our first glimpses of what Chinese life was like in the mainland. We'd lived in Hong Kong, we'd lived in, we'd lived in, 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 in Taiwan, but we didn't have an, any idea what the mainland was like. So we peeked into this courtyard and uh, just saw ordinary things happening. People coming back from work, people brushing their teeth, um, <laughs> people, uh, ch children of, um, going to school, men doing their exercises. Um, it was, to me, just riveting. There's a kid going off to school and there's a, little child leaving himself on the sidewalk and then catching up with his grandmother and his grandmother has bound feet and they don't see that in China anymore. The Cultural Revolution was still going on and although it was not politically tense for the ordinary people, very much so for, however, for the leadership. But anyway, the posters went up urging people to do various things including work hard and pulled together, etc. This is the U.S. Liaison Office then being built. Now it's the residence of the U.S. Ambassador, but then it was the entire office. And we lived, um, we, we, we were, we lived very close to our, 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 our residence area. Um, People's Liberation Army kept careful track of us, guarded us well, and um, this was where we lived. This was a community of diplomatic residences called uh, Jiangguo Manwai. And it uh, was a gated community. Chinese had a very hard time getting in. Here's some of the inmates um, playing volleyball. Uh, not that we were imprisoned at all, but uh, it was, we, were in, we were isolated. Now, if you think that pollution is a new problem in China, in 1973, we could count 101 different chimneys from our kitchen window. And um, everybody, of course, cooked their breakfast with charcoal. And so the result on a clear October day was what you see before us. Not everybody lived in these, um, in, 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 in these modern quarters, these wonderful old four courtyard house um, that the Swiss Embassy had. There's me going to pay my respects uh, to our, my, my opposite number. This was down in the legation quarter. Now I, I think it's houses, houses of some units of the, of the government. We would also go to the Great Wall and we didn't go to the place where Nixon went. We went to sort of wilder, more far-flung areas. Um, this was one of them, very steep. Um, we'd always been told that you could um, patrol the Great Wall on horseback, but I doubted that. After having watched Sheila go up and down this particular steep pitch. We also had our trips to the Ming tombs. Our children were there. They were called in Chinese Big Tiger, Tiger Number Two, and Tiger Number Three, <laughs> Da Hu, Ar Hu, and San Hu. And um, there's San Hu. He's about to climb onto a camel and lose his shoe. <laughs> and there's his 
elder brother taking a picture, and there's Sheila reading the only guide that was available at that time, which was Nagel's guide from Switzerland. We also went to the Ming tombs, and uh, but we we did so uh, to, to, to the places that had never been dug up or developed. Uh, there are uh, 13 Ming tombs in all, but the 11 had never been touched. Why bother, said the archaeologists. We know what's in there, and there's lots more interesting stuff that's being dug up from previous times. So this is October. This is uh, the time when the persimmons are being harvested and transported into Beijing uh, in these uh, horse carts. And we would... Uh, have visitors come and we take them for very relaxed picnics um, and to toast each other with Bloody Marys, which we thought was the nearest thing to a revolutionary drink that you could uh, <laughs> devise. <coughs> the Forbidden City was also a place where we went as, as uh, resident diplomats, only the scene was quite different from the pomp and circumstance of, of Nixon's time and also very different from what you see now. Here the place is relatively empty. We went in with an old lady with her family. Um, it was open to the public, but very few people actually went. Um, nowadays, of course, it's thronged with hun hun tens of thousands of people every day. We spent a lot of time on bicycles. Bicycles were very important to us. One, it was a great way of getting around, but more important, bicycles were the only um, milieu on which you could have a relaxed conversation with an ordinary Chinese. Um, they were not allowed to talk to foreigners um, walking along in the street, were reported on, uh, but when you were on bikes, and of course there were several million registered bikes in Beijing in those days, uh, you could, they would come pedaling up and you'd have a conversation. They'd say, well, are you an Albanian? And I said, no, I'm an American. Oh yeah, we heard you were in town. Um, how's it going? And so on and so forth. Um, so we did a lot of biking. This is, uh, this, this particular lane, this particular hutong, is um, uh, called Liu Li Chang, and it's now still there, but it's very much, very much uh, fixed up now. These were all people who sold art. They sold, the stores all sold paintings and, and, and things like that. And so we frequented. This is a stunning action shot with me. You see my head down below. Um, I'm steering with one hand and taking a movie with the other. Um, I didn't crash, but that almost did. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that was what one did. And when George Bush came through to take over his job as uh, liaison office chief in 1975, he came to Tokyo. He asked what I should do, what he should do first. I said, buy a bike. And he did. Now, these are the Western Hills. We're looking at the space between the Western Hills and Beijing. This is now all full up with city. The city has expanded, six big ring roads around the city, filling up all that area. But the Western Hills were a refuge for people who wanted to go and get some greenery, some countryside, and um, it's still very beautiful to this day. <coughs> Temple of Heaven, another place that we went uh, as a family. And um, then it was quite empty. There's Dahu, Arhu, and Sanhu. Um, nowadays, it is kind of the central place for all the retired people. This is Sanhu and his friend, a young Lily boy, son of Jim Lily, later became ambassador. And this is October 1st. And the contrast between October 1st then and now is really quite striking. You see um, lots of skits going on in various parks. Um, it, it, it has a very kind of people's holiday flavor, uh, sort of like state or county fairs. This is uh, 
This is the, the uh, Summer Palace shooting galleries. Um, everybody around um, enjoying themselves. Security men going out for a row. Um, others uh, standing in watch or keep, keeping their eye on us. But uh, it, it was a very um, re relatively relaxed time. And com compared to now, there's a huge parade, which has to be letter perfect, which is re rehearsed many, many times, and nobody ever gets to see it because it's, it has to be shown on TV. This is a PLA troupe, which is explaining to all of us the efficacy of Chairman Mao's thought. She's so interested, she forgot to play her interest. <laughs> so he's saying, I'm having real trouble lifting this weight. Now I arm myself with the Chairman Mao's thought, and up it goes. <laughs> Mao still had three more years to live, and the Cultural Revolution technically went on for until he died. Um, but it, it had a kind of an amateur our quality and, and was quite different from now. One of the things that we did was to um, accompany visiting delegations and the first sort of people-to-people -people delegations began to come in when the liaison offices were set up. This is Guangzhou, this is, this is Canton City on a, on a very rainy June day when the American swimming team is about to show up to do an exhibition with their Chinese counterparts. And it was very wet. Uh, here comes the Chinese team, all beautifully uh, uniformed. And here come the Americans. <laughs> Americans come slouching in under raincoats, plastic raincoats. Uh, <clears throat> these are stylistic differences between the two countries <laughs> that last to this day but it has not prevented us from developing a very important and lasting relationship together. Of course, when we, the Americans got in the water, they turned out to be very competent, and everybody was glad that they were there. These, our, our, our swimmers were Olympic class medalists, very relaxed, very good ambassadors, um, and we learned a lot from them, and we learned a lot from tagging along with them. Uh, here's the Pearl River in flood, um, with a makeshift raft. Here's a lot of people living on the water in sampans, junks with sails. Now, these pictures really draw gasps from young audiences in China, who don't, have never seen pictures of junks with sails, really. Um, this is the commune on the outskirts of Canton. Here are the farmers going to work. And uh, this is Mickey King, who was our gold medalist diver for about 12 years. And these are scenes, these are scenes from, from ordinary life, um, which we were permitted to see, and very, um, very relaxed. This is Chairman Mao's house in Hunan province. We went to Changsha to do a swimming exhibition. There are the swimmers and the Chinese onlookers. They, um, anyone who thought that Mao was, was from poor peasant stock had better take a look at his father's house because it was big and very well, it was handsome. Um, here are river boats coming down the Xiang River in Hunan province, propelled by sail and oars. This is the number one normal school in Changsha where Mao Zedong himself taught. And um, it's very well preserved. It's a beautiful sort of fusion of architectural styles they preserved the well where he washed, and the spittoons are very carefully kept up, um, and it's a good-looking building. This is Shanghai. We went to swim in Shanghai, and here is the confluence of the um, 
Huampu River and the Sujo Creek. The Sujo Creek is the black one that's emptying into the Great Grey River, and that is Pudong across the way. That is Pudong in 1973. And um, we got a chance to, to, see, uh, to see this important spot and also Shanghai communes in the Shanghai area. These uh, people were all farming or making bricks. These ladies sped up quite noticeably when we came <laughs> um, But again, for us, the chance to see what Chinese life was like was incredibly valuable. <coughs> and when, and, and, and here's a schoolyard, here are some young kids who've been sent down, Red Guards, former Red Guards, who are now doing their manual labor on the commune. And here are their elders coming in for lunch, a scene that was replicated all over China at this time of day. Now, other important visitors, the Philadelphia Orchestra came, and Eugene Ormandy is here, and and the Philadelphia Orchestra made a huge impact on China, and still does to this day. Ormandy was one of the great maestros of his time. And the orchestra members also bought frisbees, which the Chinese had never seen. Uh, but Madame Mao was in charge of, of culture. And Madame Mao and or Ormandy had a, had a disagreement about what he should play. He, he didn't want, he, she wanted him to play Beethoven VI. And um, my job was to convince him to do it, <laughs> which I did. Um, but it was a near thing. Anyway, um, the, or the orchestra has been back to China many times and is now developing a, a strategy to go and work in the provinces where major secondary cities have built huge concert halls. but don't have too much opportunity to interact with a world-class orchestra. So <clears throat> we're now going, this is the end of the, of the Shanghai visit for Ormandy, and we're going up the river in a boat, being serenaded by Chinese musicians, virtuosi, on their traditional instruments. And I have to say, it's, it, I really wish I had sound for this, these guys put on an amazing performance. And um, Chinese and American music have been a very important bond between our countries, starting really at that particular point. And when there were no delegations to show around, our family turned into a delegation and went visiting on our own. This is the Platt family delegation. The reason we did this, of course, was because, and here are scenes from North China, rail, the, the railway, dry, hot, July. We went to Wuhan, which is the hottest city in China. Why anybody wanted to go to the hottest city in China in the hottest month of the year, people expressed real puzzlement about that, but we were, we were curious and we wanted to see. Anyway, the Chinese have never, um, had no experience with children traveling. So we said, don't worry, we'll just behave like an, any delegation. You can show us whatever you want. Our children all played their roles. They asked specific questions of each of the briefers and um, everybody had a comfortable time. What we saw, of course, was the way people moved things across the Great Yangtze River. And this was all done by hand. Uh, here's a man and a donkey in harness together. Actually, the man was doing all the work. But they were pulling their loads by hand up the bridge, across the bridge, and then down the other side, trying to keep the brakes on. Um, there's the bridge itself, which was a great achievement uh, of the of the government, but uh, nowadays things are even further advanced. Here we've drawn a crowd: Oliver, Platt, Arhu, Tiger Number Two has become a 
recognized movie star. This is his first crowd. <laughs> uh, and um, we asked uh, what they'd like us to see, and they said, well, we'd like you to see the number two Wuhan iron and steel mill. Well, what could be more fitting for the hottest city <laughs> in the hottest month than to go and visit a blast furnace? Um, but we told them we are game, and so we went up the river and visited the, this huge uh, factory, still there, still the number two producer in the country. Here are members of our delegation getting prepared uh, for a cooling experience, and there they are scampering around. There's the, the chief of the delegation. And uh, here's a member of the delegation, and it was hot. <laughs> but we learned, and we also went to a hospital where they wanted to show us how acupuncture was used as an anesthetic. Now, I want to warn you, this is quite graphic, so um, viewer discretion is advised. Um, but this young lady is having a goiter removed from her throat. And she is awake, behind a sort of a screen, her head is behind a screen. She has a bunch of needles attached to various, in various parts of her body and attached also to electrical impulses. And um, she's uh, being talked to and comforted by people behind the screen. She's not really in any great discomfort. After it's all over and after that big goiter has been removed from her throat, she departs waving and saying nice things about Chairman Mao. <laughs> so this is the, this is, uh, this is, these are the real tourist spots. This is Westlake in Hangzhou, where <coughs> poets for centuries have uh, drunk wine and written poems and had a great time. The difference nowadays is that uh, Hangzhou has become a light industrial center and the pollution makes it very difficult to see across the lake now. But it's beautiful as it always was. This is the confluence of the Grand Canal and the uh, Suzhou Creek, which you saw emptying darkly into the Huangpu River a little while ago. Again, the transportation is by sail and, and oars. A very big far cry from what happens nowadays. But that was China then. These are hanks of wool, colorful, about to be turned into rugs, carpets, and Tianjin. Perhaps our favorite thing to do when we were living in Beijing was to go skating at the Summer Palace Pond. There's the, the famous boat. That, oop, here's a diplomat taking his first cautious <laughs> steps. Um, the ice was black and hard. Um, our children loved to go out and pretend they knew what they were doing and <laughs> fell down a lot, which of course is the nicest and funniest thing you can possibly do. They drew a large crowd of Chinese wondering what these foreign children were doing <laughs> falling down all the time. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> it was, it was to totally entertaining to them. So we drew a crowd, got bigger and bigger. And so Oliver and his brother put on a show of their own. This is pure fakery. <laughs> and uh, they, this fight drew a lot of attention and uh, they had a lot of fun with it. So, <laughs> the Chinese enjoyed the scene. Here were young children who were on their ice carts. And the ice carts are, are little platforms on skates and they had big long ice picks that propelled them along. So, um, all movies are supposed to end with the sun setting somewhere. And so, that's what's happening here. And this is the end of this film.
So that's a picture of China then. And um, I've shown it in many, many different Chinese cities and I always get, uh, I get the, the reaction from the younger generation is, we never really realized how poor China was. And the elders, their teachers, say these movies bring back to us what that period was like. And we have some nostalgia for it. Even though we were poor and even though the politics were tense, um, at least we believed in something. That's the reaction I've gotten from, from the middle generation. And there are some others who say, and these are usually CEOs in their late 40s or mid 40s, who say, why do we have to rely on a foreigner to show us these movies? Why has our government never presented them to us? Well, that's for the government to respond. But China likes to look ahead. China likes to focus on <laughs> the progress that they've made. I'm going to um, transition to the present by giving you a couple of readings from this book. Um, first of all, I want to describe um, the only time that I ever really had any direct or meaningful contact with President Nixon. <clears throat> I spoke with Richard Nixon for the first and last time on February 28, 1972, the night the Shanghai communique was signed. I arrived early for the meeting at the official guest house. The president was sitting in a flowered silk dressing gown over an open collar shirt and trousers, a long fat cigar in one hand and a tall scotch and soda in the other. He looked drained but satisfied with what he'd accomplished. What an extraordinary looking man he was up close. Huge head, small body, duck feet, puffy cheeks, about three walnuts apiece, my notes indicated, and pendant jowls hanging down, the entire combination exuding authority. Secretary of State William P. Rogers, my boss, came in. H.R. Haldeman was already there, hair close-cropped, yellow legal pad and sharp pencils close to hand. Henry Kissinger was nowhere to be seen. Assistant Secretary Marshall Green and John Holdridge, that was the white-haired man playing volleyball, with, from Kissinger's staff, arrived a bit later and the discussion began. These men, the leading Asian experts in the U.S. government, were leaving on a tour of Asian capitals the next day to explain what Nixon had accomplished in China the past week. The president did virtually all the talking. He shaped the individual approach our experts would take with each leader at every stop based on his own knowledge and personal relationship. Tell President Marcos that I said this, X, Y, or Z. Make sure Korean President Park understands that and then he'd make a point. And Japanese Prime Minister Sato should bear in mind the following. The President had um, a substantive grasp and a personal message for each. Um, he predicted a generally favorable reaction from Asia's leaders. Only Taiwan had reason for disappointment, he said. However, Jiang Kai-shek could be confident that we would maintain our security commitment and anyway, where else could he turn? Nixon's performance was a tour de force, close-up confirmation of his repute as the great foreign policy president of his time. The experts were not advising him what they should say. He was telling them. And as the meeting came to an end, he made a point of thanking each of us for our work. Secretary Rogers introduced me to him as one of the new China specialists in the State Department. Actually, I'd been working on it for 10 years, but anyway. <laughs> I told Nixon I'd spent 10 years working, preparing for this trip, and was grateful to him for making it happen. He accompanied me to the door of his suite, placed an avuncular flowered arm on my shoulder as we went. Well, he said, 
as we reach the door, you China boys are going to have a lot more to do from now on. <laughs> Hence the name of the book, China Boys. Um, I've, um, the book describes my getting interested in foreign service, marrying someone who was willing to, to leap into the beyond without any real idea what we were getting in for, uh, the process of learning Chinese, the process of analyzing China from Hong Kong, which was our first, um, our first professional post as China language people. And that was, of course, as the Cultural Revolution began. Then later on, the time that we, um, we spent, I went back to Washington, I was in charge of uh, the China analysts of the State Department, and at that point, Soviet Union and, and, and China were at daggers drawn, fighting along the Usuri River in Heilongjiang, along the Russian border. And it was that tension which led the Chinese to start signaling us, and Nixon, who w wanted to have a relationship with, with the Chinese and made that <coughs> uh, early on in 1967. At that point, um, things began to happen. And then the preparations for the trip itself, the liaison office year, the accident, traffic accident that took us away from China that made us, made it, required us to leave, years in Japan broadening out, getting to be a real Asia hand, and then getting back into Chinese affairs Later on, when we, the People's Liberation Army and uh, the Pentagon wanted to get together in the aftermath of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And so that's kind of the sweep of the book. The, we also cover later on leaving uh, the State Department and the Foreign Service and uh, going to work at the Asia Society whose English cousin is Asia House in London, um, which gave me a chance to show what non-governmental organizations can do in fostering relationships with, between countries. So it's, it's a, it's a, it, it leaves out my service as ambassador in Zambia and Philippines and Pakistan. It's purely sort of a China book. Um, and someday I'll try and cover the other periods. Um, I talked to Henry Kissinger about this book just a, several months after it was published. And uh, he was curious. Uh, he said, I've been told, he said, I've been told <laughs> that you've written a book that I have to read before I can finish mine. Oh, I said, that's a very flattering thing to say. And he said, well, um, I'm very interested to know what the thesis of the book is. I said, well, the thesis of the book is this. Um, when our relationship began, you and President Nixon um, did it, and, and Mao and Joe and so forth did it because you wanted to get, keep the Soviet Union off balance for different reasons. It was a balance of power exercise. And you kept all of that very much to yourself. Um, and people complained, not the China boys, because we were quite happy to be there under for any, any reason, uh, that we were all relegated to the nuts and bolts. The nuts and bolts of the relationship being, you know, um, trade, travel, investment, uh, immigration, legal issues, culture, sports, uh, the sinews of a people-to-people -people relationship, all of which began, as you saw in that film, uh, at the time of the liaison office. But over time, that, those nuts and bolts became the relationship. 
they became the relationship. They, the, the trade and travel, of course, now trade is now four hundred billion dollars. In not in balance, but it's a big amount. Travel uh, is is huge. Uh, investment is close to a hundred billion. Um, not a day passes when there aren't 5,000 people in the air between America and China um, doing ordinary things, basically business things, not government things. Uh, but those ties began then and grew and grew and grew, and the actual rationale, the strategic rationale for the U.S.-China relationship went away. Um, the personnel changed. Nixon was out of office in a, in a year or two. Um, Kissinger was out of office later on, uh, five, five, six years later. Soviet Union ceased to exist in 1989, 90. Tiananmen, the massacre of Tiananmen occurred um, in June of 1989, which soured relationships between China and the rest of the world, including the United States. But the structure of the, the nuts and bolts had fastened a relationship strong enough to withstand that. And it's gone on from strength to strength. And nowadays, the relationship has got a strategic overlay to it. The management of our bilateral relationships uh, is such that um, uh, the complexity of figuring out where we compete and where we co cooperate has become uh, the substance of, of, the, of the relationship. And Kissinger looked at me and he said, that's good, I think I'll steal it. Um, <laughs> anyway, his book will come out soon and we'll read it with care and see if he did steal it. I don't know if he will or not. Um, people have asked me, well, what did you learn? How could you learn anything during one of these, the Nixon trip? And I said, it's very hard because those trips, those visits were very carefully choreographed and everything was all very special and we were completely isolated and so forth. We learned a lot more later on. But I thought I'd read you a little bit about what happened uh, at the opening dinner uh, where I suddenly um, came out of my trance and looked around and uh, learned something. Um, this is called Dining with the Elders. No one who attended the opening dinner will ever forget it. The sheer size of the Great Hall of the People made one feel like an ant in a movie set. Everyone in the President's party was invited, including air crews and baggage handlers, flowing in an excited crowd up the wide staircase. As the official party was photographed on a grandstand at the top of the stairs, we could hear music wafting from the giant banquet hall just inside just inside the hall's entrance. On a raised platform sat the People's Liberation Army Band in baggy, rankless uniforms, playing a sublime and authentic rendition of Turkey in the Straw. The hall was lit dramatically in the focus on the Chinese and American flags hanging side by side. All right, you've seen that in Nixon in China and those, those pictures and so forth of that dinner. I moved in something of a trance through a receiving line of Chinese leaders I had read and written about for years, headed by Premier Zhou Enlai, Marshal Ye Jianying, and Vice Premier Li Xianian. Gathering my wits, I noted from a swift scan of the tables in the cavernous room, and this you didn't see in Mao and China, that many of the Chinese guests were extremely old some in wheelchairs with oxygen tubes attached to their noses. Two of these were at my table, a famous historian named Tang 
and an old politician from Sichuan province named Liu. They were museum pieces, produced periodically to maintain an image of democratic unity. Mr. Liu could not eat, drink, hear, or speak more than a few words and had to be lifted bodily by attendants for the historic friendly toasts by Joe and Nixon. The Chinese kept returning to the question of age, commenting on how young the American delegation was. They weren't talking about me. They were talking about Nixon and our top leaders. They were right. The Chinese leaders were the same people who'd taken power in 1949, 23 years before. To be a match, our delegation would have had to be led by Harry Truman and George Marshall. China, I now understood, was caught in a generational logjam, and it would be six more years before Deng Xiaoping, under house arrest and nowhere in sight that evening, would break it. I met, Joe, I met Deng Xiaoping later on, and when the, this is in 1980, and, and <clears throat> when the military establishments got together, the Chinese had two questions for us. One was, how do we get the best technology from you that your law and attitudes will allow? And the second question was, how do you retire? <laughs> what, how do you pay your retired officers? At, at what age do they retire? I mean, their, their officers were very old. Um, and, and their whole establishment kind of reflected this logjam. And Deng Xiaoping, I think, his greatest... His greatest... Uh, achievement was to break that logjam. I have a little vignette of him and it's worth closing this part of the, of the program with it if I could find it. I had read about Deng Xiaoping for more than a decade and shaken his hand during a reception in Washington following normalization in 1979, but had never had a long, close look. He did not disappoint. A tiny man less than five feet tall. He was brisk, blunt, and funny. Dung hawked and spat like a peasant in the field, startling visitors with frequent loud and wet offerings to the spittoon by his feet a practice all the more striking in the formal grandeur of the great hall of the people. Expectorations aside, he kept his guests guess guessing with a mixture of light humor and blunt, heavy substance. Greeting our Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, for the first time, he lamented, China is backward. We don't have anything to export. Perhaps we can export these hot towels which are being passed around. Meant as a joke, this was Dunk's least accurate prophecy. Anyway, he chose not to promote himself to higher rank and would later resign from all formal positions. Although he remained China's top leader, until he died in 1997, at age 92. He did not move around, move against those around him immediately, but he put the handwriting on the wall for them. He broke the generational logjam, freeing the way for fresh generations of leaders to manage China's rise. So, I think what I'd like to do now is throw the session open to your questions. And I'm perfectly happy to talk about anything you want to talk about, whether it's current issues or what things were like then, what was Joe and Lai like, what were the other characters like in those days, or, you know, why do we fight about exchange rates and uh, all those things. So who would like to start the bidding, start the conversation? Oh, it takes just one person. Slightly heroic tendencies. Well, one very simple question. The, the film, which was fantastic, um, is it available online anywhere, or can it only be shown regularly at this event? 
Well, you know, it's, it's, I have not attached any great proprietary um, uh, protections to it. And, and people have put it up online. The one thing I have not put up online is the narration. Because I think it's, I, I like to, to narrate it myself, and I like to do it slightly differently for each audience, depending on my sense of them and what they're interested in. So it's out there, and it's not a big, it's not a private thing, uh, but I have not attached a soundtrack to it uh, or, or, or a, a, a narration. And I don't think I will for a little while longer. Who's next? Natasha, you had your hand up. Yeah, I thought it was really fascinating. You know, absolutely great talk. Um, I have a very um, simple question. During this time in, in China, did you have any sort of private contact with Chinese people, like friends? Or was that possible? Maybe to the family, to kids? Or it was very hard to have. Uh, hmm? Yeah. What did did what, did we when we were in China in in the seventy three living there? Did we have any Chinese friends and did we have any contacts, uh, private contacts with Chinese? We tried, but it was really difficult. Um, Chinese usually relaxed when they left the capital. So if we were traveling with a delegation. We could have co good conversations with Chinese on, on um, the, the subjects in which they were expert and so forth. But when we tried to mm, consolidate those into you know firmer relationships, when we got back, we we were, ran into a wall. I remember going back to Beijing after having had some good conversations with an opposite number in the foreign office. Um, and asking him to come, you know, for a family picnic with us, um, like the ones we were showing. <clears throat> uh, and I was told, uh, and I gave, I gave them plenty of warning, he was to be in three weeks' time. And I asked if, if Mr. Wong could join us, and his assistant immediately said, no, that won't be possible. He's, uh, he's, he's ill. <laughs> and uh, I said, but uh, you know, this is three weeks from now, and perhaps he'll recover. And now his assistant said, no, he'll, he'll still be sick. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the message was, was loud and clear. Um, it is true, however, that the contacts that we made at those times during the Nixon trip and subsequently at the liaison office uh, turned into relationships later on when things eased up for the Chinese. Um, everybody was very tense and worried about making a mistake during the period leading up to Mao's death and after. And it wasn't until Deng had really uh, consolidated his power and decided to open up the country that people became became more relaxed, but then we found that we could um, develop relations with other people who we knew then. And if you'd been there then, uh, it gave you a kind of a leg up. So, for example, um, the ambassador to the UK, a man a few years ago named Ma Yujun, Ma Yujun. Uh, later became the high commissioner, the, the commissioner, the Chinese commissioner to, to Hong Kong, right after, um, right after reversion in 1997, 1998. And he was somebody I knew. Um, he was handling the press for the Nixon trip. He was an officer, more or less my rank. Anyway, I had no, I, I, I had kept up with him and we, saw each other. I went to see him a year after Hong Kong had reverted and uh, he saw me readily and I walked in and I said, tell me, what are your instructions? And uh, he said, my instructions are to do nothing. 
and I'm following them to the letter. <laughs> so, and that's true. I mean, that with with some exceptions on certain issues, the Chinese have not tried to uh, to run Hong Kong, and there's a, a really good reason for that, and that is they don't have a clue how to do it, and they know that. I mean, Hong Kong is a very complicated place, and they're smart enough to live up to their commitments, not to not to rock the boat. But anyway. We, I have relationships now that you know, date back to that time. And, and of course, they're quite valuable because the Chinese really, they really like people who, who keep coming back. They like, quotes, old friends. I tell them, I'm just the fossil who talks. <laughs> <laughs> who else in the back? How closely will you observe, how closely will you observe by security? Uh, we, we, we couldn't. I mean, we actually, we could move around by bike and so on and so forth, but if we went from city to city or something like that, every time we went, every time we moved, um, we had to check in with the public security people, we had to register, we had to get permission to, to go to another city and so forth, and uh, then uh, minders were uh, attached to us and kept and, and they, they, uh, they kept track of us and guided us and so on and so forth. Now it's much, much, much easier. But in those days it was, it was pretty tight control. We could get on our bikes and we could go around the city and to the places that uh, we were we, we normally frequented and didn't feel that we were being surveilled. Uh, uh, but, but it was clear from our own pictures that they that they were watching. Yes, in the back. Um, you mentioned uh, Mao Zedong's wife, Jiang Ting, in terms of the visit of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Yeah. How apparent was she at the time? How great did you consider her influence to be? Well, those of us who have been working on the Cultural Revolution, you know, from outside of China, knew that she was one of the real um, uh, left, leftist leaders, and and uh, those of us who'd met her during Nixon's trip um, saw her playing her leading revolutionary role. Uh, she was always dressed in a very severe Mao suit and uh, severe expression, and she took us. To see one of her, we thought, kind of horrible cultural presentations. This was called the Red Detachment of Women, and it was a ballet with very good dancers, all dressed in, in military uniforms and pirouetting with Mausers and things like that, with automatic pistols, etc. Um, and that was the role that we had gotten used to her in. When we got to Beijing, though, in 73, um, I remember meeting her and dealing with her, uh, first of all, at a basketball game in June 73 between Americans and Chinese, the first such. And she came into the sort of ante room and she was clearly in a new role. She had a dress on. That was in itself astonishing. It was the kind of dress that um, Eleanor Roosevelt would have worn. Uh, very big gabardine pockets. And so she had a silk. She had a what? Silk. Was it silk? <laughs> it was silk. <laughs> Actually, um, she had white gloves and a matching handbag and she was and, and, and white sh and shoes and a Rolex watch on and a permanent wave very gentle I said to myself what is going on here and um, she behaved in, in a queenly manner she spoke in queenly tones happily very slowly so I could you know fill in as interpreter 
And we went to the basketball game, and she was very gracious, and she took all kinds of, and this was very public, 17,500 people, national, international media, etc., etc. Pictures plastered all over world media of Madame Mao um, in her queenly role. And we all figured out, I've described this in some detail in the book, and we did learned dispatches on the subject. And it was, we believe, it was her debut, public debut, as a successor to Mao. She wanted to present herself in a role that would be, um, that, that, that would be a break with the past and make her more acceptable for the future. We got to see her a lot and then during the Ormandy visit. And uh, she and Ormandy, as we negotiated, we negotiated all the programs for the Ormandy visit, like treaties, you know. They, no, you can't play the afternoon of the fawn. It's too prurient. Um, Schubert and Mozart are politically neutral. They're fine. Um, <laughs> The Pines of Rome is okay, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. Anyway, uh, she really wanted to have Ormandy play Beethoven's Sixth, the Pastoral Symphony. And they sprang this on us. We, we thought we had an agreement that he wouldn't play it, but. Normandy and 130 tired musicians are on their glide path into Shanghai. And their Chinese officials come to me and they say, we have a, a request from on high, from the highest levels, to play Beethoven's sixth. And so, that's my problem. But I'd always go into Shanghai to meet delegations and I'd use the trip back to Beijing to get to know them and to brief them and so on and so forth. So Ormandy was very welcoming. We sat next to each other on the plane and I said to Maestro, um, I want you to know that uh, we've gotten a very high level request for Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. And he said, you know I hate Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. <laughs> and I don't want to play it. And I said, and I didn't bring the scores. I said, well, let me try to explain why Madame Mao and the Chinese are so, I think this is so important. And then I just started to improvise, <laughs> to make things up. And I said, first of all, you have to remember that the Chinese Communist Party came to power as part of a peasant revolution. So the peasantry and the countryside and so forth are very important to them. <laughs> Second of all, the Chinese, as you know from studying their music, they love program music, i.e. music which describes events and, and scenes and so on and so forth. And of course, Pastoral Symphony is program music. And of course there's a, in the fourth movement there's a big storm, you know, and that's, they think that's the revolution. And I mean this, my lips are just flapping. You know, like I was doing. And, 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 and then there's that wonderful peaceful ending, which they equate with their, with their, uh, the victory of the revolution. Uh, so Ormandy rolls his eyes and he says, okay, uh, when in Rome, I will do as the Romans wish. But you have to get me the scores. So I said, all right, well, don't tell anybody because they'll be after us and, and I'm going to hold this back. Chinese practice in those days was to renegotiate everything the moment uh, a delegation arrived totally whacked out and, and uh, dying to go to bed and so on and so forth. But anyway, it, became, it was a big success um, and 
uh, we got we got sixty scores from Central Orchestra in, in Beijing and seventy from from Shanghai, and uh, they all had different bowing marks and different <laughs> dynamics and so forth. But the orchestra knew the knew it by heart, and and of course Ormandy did too. And I asked. 35 years later, we had a ceremony in, in Beijing. I, Sheila and I were both there. And I asked um, one of the 10 musicians who was still in the orchestra who was there during that trip. I said, what, 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 what was Ormandy's problem with Beethoven's Sixth Symphony? Oh, they said, you know, he, the maestro always liked the symphony to end with a big bang. And the quiet ending for the Beethoven Sixth put him off. He never liked it. And anyway, they played it like a dream. And they just watched Ormandy, and he, by that, he was very much into it. Anyway, great success. So, who's next? We've got a few more minutes. We can go in the front here. Um. I was very lucky and able to, on bicycles, I cycled across China a few years ago. And I, after seeing your film, I felt almost as if I was too late, because by the time we went from the west, from Kashgar to, to Beijing, and they, it, they had cookie-cuttered the entire country with these amazing cities, 10 blocks deep, and then all the sort of peasants lived outside of those, and there were six-lane highways, and there were two or three million um, people cities just in the middle of the, the desert. And, and, I, and, and you said the children are, are, you know, they don't, oh, we were like that. Are they going to preserve it, or is the, the rush forward just going to lose 7,000 years of history? I mean, I, they're going to have the, 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 you know, the monuments, but it, it, there's more to a country than its museums. And, 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 I, and I worry as I went across it that that would be lost. The question, the questioner, by the way, who looks extremely fit, uh, <laughs> the bicycle, um, and his wife bicycled across China and saw the cities being built and and uh, all of the progress occurring and wondered if he was too late. I don't think you were too late. I mean, I think China, at each stage of its development, represents a new set of, of challenges. Um, the, the urbanization continues apace. Chinese are determined to flip-flop the numbers of the percentages of people who live in the countryside and live in the cities from 40-60 to 60-40. They want to have 60% of the people living in, 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 in cities. And they realize from looking at other nations' um, development models that urbanization is the key to improving people's living standards. And so they, they're determined to do this and they're going to do it. And as matters now, as the pace now goes, they are building the equivalent of a city of a million people every month, uh, or adding to current cities, or in, in expanding the size of, of small villages and, and county towns. So that is going to continue. And that, of course, brings with it a lot of challenges. Um, it, it, it also has some benefits. It is what is fueling their boom. Um, this constant construction, so forth, is, uh, is keeping the economy very buoyant um, and will continue to do so for some time. <laughs> but the pressure for urbanization, the pressure for development has risen, has, has driven land prices way up and has um, forced people, the peasants, off the land, and they're not getting properly properly paid for it, they think. And there's a lot of unrest and a lot of um, dissatisfaction. So I think that they are determined to continue to do this, and they, but they at the same time want to preserve something of their past culture. And the attitude towards culture now is very different from what it was back in 1973. In those days, they just said, oh, you know, everything that came before the revolution was feudal and bad and, and, uh, and 
we don't we don't want to present that. Obviously, they preserved their monuments very very well, and as the new discoveries kept coming from different digs, which were themselves fueled by development. I mean, when you build a, a new dam, you uncover some ancient kingdom's headquarters. I mean, this, this kept happening and still keeps happening today. And they're much more, they're, they're much more interested in, in preserving uh, the culture and then the fact that they have a Confucius Institute. <coughs> itself is, is, is a sign of that. Um, and they are making sure that their own people knew, know what their rich history was and they see their culture as a, uh, an, an element of soft power, which is important. So it cuts both ways. The pace continues. Uh, the look of the countryside changes. The new discoveries of ancient archaeological sites also continues apace, and, and China continues to change. That's, that's the story. What are we doing here? Yes? It just follows on from what you, you just said, I think. You said in light of the protests and uprisings spreading between North Africa and the Middle East, do you foresee a stormy China in the future, or do you foresee a sort of bright China in the future? Uh, in, in questions in view of the, the jasmine revolutions, the, the Arab uh, Spring, or whatever we're calling it today, uh, will this affect China? Will it affect their, uh, their society? And the, the answer really is, the government is running very scared. They think that there is a possibility of uh, these, this, this, these sentiments and so forth getting out of hand. And what they're particularly concerned about is the use of the internet as a, as a means of communication to organize uh, domestic uh, protests. Um, the answer is, um, to the question of what, you know, what, what does this hold for China's future. But my own feeling is, is that the Chinese government has permitted the introduction of the internet to their country and they've used it as a way of finding out what's bothering people and they've used it as a way of pushing their own ideas and policies, um, and they also realize that it has given now 450 million Chinese a way of expressing themselves that they didn't have before. And they're not sure what to do about this. They're trying to control the internet. It's proving very difficult to control. Um, what they're really worried about is the creation of some kind of a national movement they're used to protests. There's 100,000 protests in China every year. I mean, marches or, or little riots or whatever, but nothing has ever, at least since the Falun Gong, by the way, um, uh, presented itself as a threat of a national movement. Um, so, it's a dilemma. My own feeling, though, is that the Chinese... Chinese society, Chinese economy, and so forth is way ahead of where these Arab countries are. Um, the Chinese Party, Communist Party, has figured out um, in the past ways of accommodating popular sentiments, ways of accommodating popular pressure uh, to enable the boom to continue and them to stay in power. And they realize that they have to keep reforming in order to stay in power. I mean, I've had leading party theoreticians say to me, the only way to keep power is to give up some power. And so what we're all looking for now is, you know, where the next concessions will be. 
clearly in China there is pe people are 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 happy with the improvement in living standards, um, which has brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But China is still not a rich country. Per capita incomes about three between three and four thousand spread over the country, higher in the cities. And so they have to they have to strike a balance. You talk to I talked to some Chinese officials, intellectuals last week, and they say the challenge that faces us is how to balance off the requirements to reform and the requirements to develop. And it's not easy. It's 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 a real really you're really walking a tightrope here. And they have a big, intelligent, educated population to deal with. Um, so the answer is we really don't know. And we're all watching with great interest. And they don't know either. Um, which is why China remains one of the most interesting places on earth. It's now 7.30 and my bosses here have told me that it's time to have a drink. <laughs> should, should, can we have one more question? Why is it everybody on this side asks the questions? In the back over there. Um, I was actually going to ask what you thought, um, whether you thought China would be still governed as one country in 50 years' time, but I think you've more or less uh, um, dealt with that question, or at least in part. So can I ask you another one? Which is, do you think that the very substantial holdings of U.S. Treasuries by the China, Chinese government is a problem for China, or a problem for the U.S., or, or not a problem at all? Well, my personal view is, is that it's not a problem. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's something that holds us together, and it's something that prevents us from beating each other up if we ever had that inclination. Um, over the years, we've worked out through trade relationships and so forth, um, two really closely intertwined, intertwined economies. And the reason why the Chinese have such big reserves of American, of Ameri of American um, bonds is because one, they kept the exchange rate low, and so they, they, they kept earning these big trade imbalances. And in, in order to um, um, shield them from pushing inflationary pressures in China, they had to turn them into something else, i.e. bonds. And the best, most reliable bond investment that you could make was U.S. Treasuries. It's an imbalance. The size of their treasury, of their of their uh, reserves, is an indication of that that our trade relationships and their trade relationships are out of whack and have to be rebalanced. And that's one of the challenges that that face us. And and but I don't think being so closely intertwined is a danger. I think it's something that prevents danger. Because every time you think about doing something rash, you realize that it's going to hurt you more than the other guy. And if the Chinese have the same thought, then they, they, they look at what happens to their holdings and so on and so forth and decide that they can't. Now, Alexander Haig was our Secretary of State um, he had a, a good grasp of, of Chinese affairs. And we were having a conversation back in, in the 90s when he was Secretary of State. And we were talking about um, the benefits of cooperation and engagement versus confrontation. And he said, you know, engagement is really the better course. If you're in the boxing ring, with an opponent that's growing in strength. The safest place is in a clinch. 
And we've worked our way into a clinch with the Chinese, and we should stay there. So that's my rather discursive answer to your question. I'm not encouraging larger um, debt holdings by the Chinese in American bonds, and I'm definitely encouraging my country to make our bonds more valuable by dealing with our own debt problems. Um, but it in itself is not a, a big threat, although some people think it is. Thank you very much.